All right, this is Drones for Mapping and Surveying, uh, put on by us here at Multicopter Warehouse. And I know uh, I see a lot of familiar names in the attendee list. So I know you guys, some of you know me, I'm Kerry Garrison. I'm the vice president here and the head of the enterprise sales department. And one thing that I have certainly seen a massive growth in, in the past year, but really in the last few months, it seems, is an explosion of interest in mapping and surveying. And I have to say that that is probably the best growth segment of aerial use today. And there it's, there's a ton of different uses for mapping and surveying technology, and we're gonna get into some of those here in just a moment. So what is it that we're, we're really talking about? Uh, it's surveying and creating 3D modeling for structural inspections, job site monitoring. Uh, there's a bunch of construction companies that are turning to drones. It saves time, it improves safety, it improves accuracy, and they can acquire data that they've never really had access to or access to in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, good example of this, one of my, my personal first experiences doing mapping was a couple years ago, there was a 42 acre crime scene here in town and the sheriff's department called and said, is there anything you can do? We, we need this data as quickly as possible. And their ground surveyors, which is all they had, were telling them that it was gonna be about two weeks to do the job and to put all the data together and give them the models. And this was a, a situation where a deputy had been shot. So they wanted the data as quickly as possible. I was able to fly it and deliver 3D maps where they could do measurements and everything from start to delivery in eight hours. So that was a huge, huge benefit to the sheriff's department. And it got a lot of people around here excited about what they could do with different mapping technologies. So some of the industries that are currently using the technology, uh, obviously surveying and mapping, which is a big one. Uh, here on the picture here, this is actually our building here. And you can see you can do measurements uh, 280 feet across the front of our building and be able to do volumetrics if you're doing stockpiles, uh, things of that nature. Construction, using it for all kinds of different purposes. Agriculture is a huge growing field for aerial re reconnaissance and analysis. Inspection work, mining and aggregates, that's huge. They need to measure stockpiles, uh, their cuts, different aspects of volumetrics that they need to work with. Public safety is doing a lot of things. In fact, PIX4D has a product that was designed for public safety. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And utility companies, uh, they, they need to map ground areas, they need to map towers, cell towers, power poles, all kinds of different things are being done on the utility side of things. Some of the different more specific uses are gonna be construction planning, uh, line measurements, which again, you can see on this screen here that I've just added a couple line measurements to kind of show you how that works. Volume measurements, that can be the volume of a building, a stockpile, uh, different, uh, not just on positive, but negative values, looking down into a mine, a strip mine, and seeing how much uh, volume has been tucked out. For construction, they're doing cut and fill calculations. Emergency management for disasters when there's been an earthquake, they can go in and map an area and very quickly show ingress and egress routes, where it's safe to go. Accident documentation, uh, we're seeing law enforcement and fire departments, whoever's tasked with documenting an accident scene can go over and do a quick map and then start clearing the scene without having to spend hours of time with their little wheels to measure skid marks and everything that can all be done after the scene has already been cleared and traffic is moving again. Land management, we're seeing all kinds of different applications in uh, Hawaii where they're mapping uh, patterns of invasive species of plants. 
they want to see how those plants are moving in and how their mitigation efforts are working. Being able to bid a job because you can get accurate measurements on exactly what needs to be done, material needs to be moved in or taken out, the sizes, the areas. Progress documentation, very big in construction right now, to be able to show the construction progress as it's going on by flying it every week or every two weeks and getting those progress shots. Damage assessment of buildings, infrastructure, different types of facilities that have taken damage. Solar panel inspection is a really big one, using a thermal camera to fly over a solar farm and you can see which panels or even cells are working or not working properly. Agriculture, I already mentioned, you can do all kinds of stuff with water analysis, plant health, drainage, all kinds of different things are happening in the agriculture world and tower inspection. And again, PIX4D has a new product that's really geared towards that type of specific use. So I think that's really, really cool. So that kind of explains the different things that people are using mapping and surveying tools for. So next, I'm going to kind of go into looking at the, the type of hardware you might want to look at and the different ones that are being used and the kind of the pros and maybe cons of each of the different ones. So give you a better understanding of the hardware that's really being used out there. There's a ton of different choices right now. There's different units that may be better for some things or versus others. And of course, the more functionality you get, the, the more you get to uh, the benefit of paying for that. So the things to consider what you are going to use the product for, uh, it could be for marketing videos, progress photography, are you going to do volumetric measurement? Are you going to do more traditional mapping and surveying? Do you need to create 3D models? And not just uh, a model that you can move around on screen, but do you need to take that data and turn it into a, a CAD file that you can then put into your existing software for your building planning and uh, to see kind of how everything will work? Uh, are you going to be doing inspection work? You might need uh, something with a a better reach of the camera, a big zoom camera, and on the progress type photo. So you got to kind of figure out what you're going to be using it for so you can determine which product may be best for you. When we're looking at the different options, you know, we want to understand how are you going to use it? How are you going to collect and manage all the data? If you're flying a lot of missions, you are going to be creating quite a bit of a data and who is going to be responsible for the system, the platform, the firmware updates, the maintenance, the software licenses, keeping all those things together. And then what are your requirements? You know, do you need, uh, are you okay with a 12 megapixel camera, a 20 megapixel camera? Do you need a 40 megapixel camera? Uh, those are going to be really dependent on your use case and kind of how much accuracy and detail you need to provide. Do you need to have a thermal camera? And that could be for not just agriculture or for uh, solar panels. It can also be if you're doing large buildings that have HVAC systems, you can see ones that are uh, overheating or running hotter than the others. You can also use it to see if there's heat leaks coming from a building. Is there uh, not enough insulation somewhere and you're getting heat leakage from it? So those things can be done with a thermal camera. And then there's special payloads, high-end zoom cameras, there's methane detectors, there's all kinds of other systems that are out there. LiDAR is going to be another one. And there's some new LiDAR systems that are coming out that are going to be, well, I say much more affordable, but they're still expensive. They're just not quite as horrifically expensive as they have been in the past. So we're looking at some new LiDAR systems that are coming to market if you really need that kind of penetration of vegetation, LIDAR would be a really great use for that. And you need to figure out what your cost, you know, do you have a budget? You don't want to skimp and miss out on, you know, a feature or higher resolution that you might need down the road. And does it integrate with other systems? So if you're already using a CAD program, some design software, 
can the files that you're getting from the mapping system integrate into your other system? And we can talk about some of that stuff down the road if you have some specific uh, products that you're using that you want to know if it'll work with. Insurance, you probably need to look at insurance systems for not just the whole insurance, but liability, making sure that you're covered there. Do you have proper training? And training is going to cover a variety of different things from your Part 107 license to working with the software and internal training. Once you have someone that knows one thing, they need to train the other people within your organization. Uh, do you need any certifications? Do you need waivers, uh, wide area authorizations, things of that nature to be able to fly in the areas that you're going to fly into? And then you need to kind of uh, and the maintenance and repairs is something that we can work with with you to understand how often you need to do maintenance, how often like motors need to be replaced, things of that nature, and then a budget for repairs should the off chance come up that you actually need a repair. Uh, one of the things that I kind of like about working with people that are already in the construction industry is they, they have a good record of mitigating risks and a, a good safety protocols and often good documentation on how to do things. Now, some of you may disagree on some of that, but the ones I've worked with, some bigger companies, they really have good processes in place for safety and they've created operational manuals to kind of describe what is their maintenance? What are they gonna do if there's an incident? How do they report that? How are they storing all their flight logs? What are they doing to you know, keep a, a log of everything that's gone on so they can track the battery usage, the aircraft usage, the flight characteristics? What did they do on that particular flight? So someone can go back and look at it. And emergency guidelines, what do you do if there's a crash, if it, there's a flyaway, if there's you know something else? They have guidelines in place already in their manual. This is what we're gonna do should these situations occur. And then you want to have good pre and post flight checklists. You know, your pre check is going to be checking your not just the aircraft, making sure the camera's working properly, that the motors aren't binded up so that there's a, a bearing problem. But it's also going to include things like checking for the airspace that you're in, making sure that the area is clear. Do you have proper boundaries so you're not violating uh, rules like flying over people or flying over moving cars? And then your post flight making sure that you know everything is, has been working properly, that everything's put away right, that the, the memory cards have been taken care of properly, all those types of stuff. And that all gets put into an operations manual. And for a lot of larger companies, this is gonna be a necessity for being able to even get insurance and making sure that kind of all your ducks are in a row. So let's kind of, I want to dig a little deeper onto the operations manual and some of the other things that you sh should consider putting into your operations manual. That's going to be your checklist, your asset, 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 hmm, that's not right, asset, asset inventory list, your safety protocols, your maintenance logs, your incident reports. And what I mean by pilot VO test reports, this can come into play if you have like a daylight waiver. So if you're flying at night, you, you really need to put into your waiver request that you're going to have regular testing of your pilots and your visual observers so that they understand nighttime operations because there's issues with vision at night, orientation, uh, lots of different things can come into play. You can learn a, a lot about that in the, the pilot's uh, handbook. and they kind of want you to put together a test and keep track of those test scores in your operations manual. And then your list of emergency contact information and then copies of whatever waivers you have. And then this operations manual should kind of be with you on every job. Hopefully this is, this is all making sense to some of you. Uh, okay, so far so good. I don't have, see any questions so far. So good, we're cooking right along. And next I want to talk about some of the, the hardware and kind of we'll start at the low end and work our way up to the high end 
and kind of get a feel for why you might want one product over another or what uh, one system can do that the other one can't. So one of the more popular ones to get started on the low end is going to be the Mavic 2 Pro or the Mavic 2 Zoom. And while this is really considered part of our enterprise line, it's not a, one of the inner or it's a consumer product, it's not in the enterprise line, they're still very, very popular and very useful. Obviously used for photos and videos. You can use it with Pix4D to get your mapping, to do your measurements, get your progress shots, to do inspection work. They're still really good machines at a very affordable price versus moving up into some of the higher end products. So you're going to be starting at around the $1,500, $1,600 range, moving up into uh, the $2,000-ish range with the Mavic 2 Pro and Zoom. And if you have questions between the Pro and the Zoom, you can always uh, talk to us later. I didn't want to go into too nitty gritty of the detail between those two products. The next one, the Phantom 4 Pro has been the absolute workhorse for commercial work for quite a while. It's good camera, flies great. The one kind of advantage it has when using mapping software is it has a mechanical shutter. So the aircraft can be moving a little bit faster than what you could do with a Mavic 2 because of that mechanical shutter. It's not as prone to issues with rolling shutter, so you can get a little bit better clarity on your images. So this is a great tool for your mapping, surveying, uh, volumetric measurements, and of course your standard photo and video uh, type stuff because it's just a kind of a good general purpose machine that's going to start at around the $1,600 price range, a couple extra batteries at $200 a pop. You know, you're going to be, you know, decked out for about two grand with a Phantom 4 Pro. And then the big brother to the Phantom 4 Pro is the newer Phantom 4 RTK. Now, what you don't see in the picture here, I actually had it on one of the first slides, you see the aircraft with a, a base station tripod system, and that's the RTK unit. So that's gonna get you a millimeter hold precision with a, up to about five, I believe it's five millimeter or so, uh, 3D modeling precision. So high accuracy. So people aren't really buying this guy just to do photos and videos. It's total overkill. But if you're going to be doing any mapping or surveying projects, then the Phantom 4 RTK is going to give you a higher level of accuracy in your images, providing more accurate mapping, surveying, 3D models, uh, and measurements. So if you really need that higher level of accuracy, that's where the Phantom 4 RTK is going to come into play. And this one, you're going to start in about the $6,000, $7,000 range, depending on whether you're already using like a positioning network. If you're using NTRIP or Trimble VRS or um, TopCon's TopNet, then you can get away without the base station. But if you're not using those, then the base station is going to bump you up um, another level and you're going to be in the, you know, about $9,000 range, all totally decked out. And the big Mac daddy of all these is the Matrice 210. Big advantage being able to have dual cameras on here. You have a regular daylight camera or a zoom camera and a thermal camera. So you can do multiple tasks at the same time. So definitely top of the line platform for any type of application, you're mapping, you're surveying, volumetrics, photos, videos, progress shots, inspections, water damage, thermal leakage, solar panel inspection, site security, you name it. If you want to do it, the Matrice 210 is definitely the, the big daddy out there. And just the aircraft alone is going to start around 10,000. And then whatever your payloads you have are going to go up from there from around 2,000 for a good daylight camera to almost $13,000 for the X-T2 thermal camera. So big, big broad range of stuff there. Uh, Mark is asking, can we get a copy of the presentation? So the answer is yes. Uh, 
in, it takes about an hour or so for me to process the recording of the webinar when we're done. And then I will send out a link. There will be a link to the certificate of completion. There'll be the YouTube link for the recording of the webinar, and there will be the PowerPoint presentation that you can download. So you'll have links to all three of those. Uh, like I said, it takes me around an hour or so to uh, process the footage and get everything up online and everything. So yes, you'll get a copy of the presentation and the recording. So you'll be all good to go. So thanks for asking. I should have mentioned that earlier on. Okay, so we've talked about the, the hardware and now we're gonna talk about kind of the software. And there is a plethora of software out there to choose from. Uh, Pix4D, probably the most popular of all of them. Uh, there's Drone Deploy, Maps Made Easy, Trace Air, ArcGIS. Um, the list goes on. There's some that are very specific to Earthworks. There's some that are specific to other things. But Pix4D is one that has a, a broad range of products to fit different uh, vertical markets. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hand this over to Caroline Bailey. She's the channel program manager for North America with PIX4D. And um, she's gonna kind of take it from here and give us more of a rundown on the software side of things. So Caroline, are you all ready to go? Hi, Carrie. Yes, I am. Thanks for introducing me. Um, are you going to share am, my screen? I am getting ready to cut over to you right now here, if things will work right. Okay. All right. Show my screen. Great. Can you see my screen? Uh, can uh, can you guys see her screen? Okay, yes, they can see your screen. Oh, okay, um, fantastic. Okay, before we, we move on, let's. I wanna address just two questions that are here. Um, Keith is asking, do most of the sensors for the M210 attach to the M600? And the answer is no. Um, there's they, the payloads are different. So the X5S, the XT2, the uh, X7 do not work on the Matrice 600. So the 600 you can get like the X5 camera for, or you can get LiDAR systems for, but the other payloads do not work on the M600. And James is asking, does this work well with the Inspire Pro? Yes, you absolutely can use an Inspire Pro for this. We typically don't sell Inspires for mapping, surveying type stuff because that was designed more of a cinematography platform. But when I, that mapping mission I told you about where I did that 42 acre crime scene, I actually did that with an Inspire One. So um, go ahead, take it away. Great, well, thank you, Kerry, for the introduction. Um, my name is Caroline Bailey. I'm the PIX4D Channels Program Manager for North America. So although you might detect a British accent, I'm actually working for the US team for PIX4D. I've been doing that since January. And I've been working for PIX4D out of Switzerland for four years altogether. So happy to be here today. I hope you're all fine based at home. I'm in my kitchen right now on coronavirus lockdown. So <laughs> I hope everyone's fine and enjoying the webinar. So PIX4D has its headquarters in Lausanne in Switzerland. That's where we were founded. Uh, we now have offices across the world. Uh, we opened a new one in Denver last year, and we also have one in San Francisco. So as soon as the lockdown is over, I'm going to be out in Denver. So if anybody wants to get in touch for more information about PIX4D, um, contact Kerry, contact me at any time. All of the things I'll talk about today will be available through Multicopter Warehouse, including training and certification. So if you want a variety of products and any of the training as well, just get in touch with Kerry or with me. Okay, so in case you've not heard of Pix4D before, this is what it does. 
it takes images usually collected by drones but actually they could come from any cameras including mobile phones and it puts them into our software and creates 2d and 3d maps so the idea is that instead of just having a bunch of images and you know you might collect thousands of images and just be storing them in my pictures my documents this puts them together in a meaningful way so that you and your whole team or your clients can look at the maps and see what's there, what decisions need to be made, what's the problem, and all be on, be on the same page much faster. The concept is that you first collect your images, so you capture them. That could be with a fixed wing drone, with a multi-copter drone, with any kind of camera, including a phone. The red thing you see there is a um, multi-spectral camera. So that's intended to cover agriculture, but can also be used for other purposes. And you can also use thermal cameras, like Harry mentioned already. But Caroline, yes. On a stand, you show it like a DSLR camera. There, does will that work with any camera, or do the images have to be GPS tagged? They don't have to be GPS tagged. So I'll talk about accuracy in a minute. It's better if they are GPS tagged so that you have some geographical or geolocation information. But you could technically use ones that aren't. You'll still create a model. It won't have a position on the globe. It'll just be like floating in the air, but it'll still be in context. So it won't have a unit with like inches and feet, and it won't have a um, position on the globe, but it will still be um, a model which is relevant to itself. So if that's all you care about, just seeing what's there, then it will still work with images from, for example, GoPros. The original ones there didn't have geotags. Excellent. Okay. Um, just for your information, if you do that, you can put in your own units. So if you have something on the ground, you know that a specific distance is one meter, you can put that into the uh, process model and recalibrate and everything in it will become equivalent to that measurement. So you can effectively give it its own unit system that way. Okay, um, yeah, so the next step is after you process, then you get these models. So 2D or 3D models, depending on the type of software you're using. And you can do various analyses. You can measure things, you can pull out contour lines, you can do video fly-throughs, that kind of thing. And then you'll go on to share it with the relevant people. So whether that's your own team or your clients or anybody else in a presentation or a webinar like this that you want to show the results to, then you can do that without them having to have the software or even create a user profile online, which is always nice in this day and age. All right. So there's loads of products online. It might be a bit confusing. <laughs> Actually, yesterday we had a huge product release and there's some more on the market. So I'm just gonna talk about three main ones today, but all of these are available from Perry. Um, the main ones I'll talk about are the top three here, Pix4D Capture, Mapper and React. But down the bottom are some that have already been mentioned today. So Matic and Survey just came out yesterday. They're for surveyors in, in particular. And pick 40 fields is for agriculture. So that's really good if you're using a multi-spectral camera, like one's um, the Red Edge from Microsense or the Sequoia from Parrot. And you, you want to find uh, index maps for looking at plant health, for example. That's what pix 40 fields is meant for. Okay, but focusing on these three, which I think are the most relevant today. You've got Pix4D Capture, which is a free software, and that's not for making maps, that's for flying the drone. And that works specifically with DJI and Parrot drones. I've got a list of all of the drones it works with online if somebody wants a link. And it can be used on an iOS or an Android phone. So that's really good for collecting good data in the first place, because with as with any software, it's kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. If you don't have a good data set, a good collection of photographs, it's never going to make you a good model. So come on to show you how that works in a sec. Then we've got Pix4D Mapper. This was our flagship software. 
And the idea here is that you uh, make 2D and 3D georeference models. So it's highly accurate when you have enough information. And the nice thing here is that you can process on your own desktop computer or on our cloud. So most of our competitors offer one or the other there. Desktop's really good. If you want full autonomy, you want to use your own computer and you don't want it to be online at all. Cloud's really good if you don't want to use your own computer because maybe you don't have a high spec one or maybe it's taking up too much processing power and you'd rather upload your photos to the cloud and have them processed by us and stored there. So you have both options of Pixboardy. Is there an, uh, an advantage to doing desktop versus cloud or vice versa? There's advantages to both. I think it really depends on what you prefer and what hardware you have. So most people use desktop because that's what we originally had. Cloud came out 2016. We've been around since 2011 in, uh, in total. Desktop is good when you want to completely control what model you make. So when you use cloud, it's a bit like a black box. You put in the images, it processes for you, and it gives you one result. You can do some analysis, but that's pretty much it. So that's really good if you don't want to learn um, all of the different options to pick and spend a lot of time doing that. Cloud's the one for you. But if you do, and you want full autonomy, so you want to be able to cut out images that you realize afterwards were irrelevant, uh, you want to cut out whole sections of the point cloud or whole classes of points, like all the vegetation, um, all of the buildings, because actually you're only interested in the lay of the land, then you can do that on desktop. So I'd say you have options there, but it does take up more space and more processing power on your computer. And the, the desktop versions are only available for Windows, correct? Um, they're available for Windows and for iOS for some softwares. But I would I would say Windows for everything as a safe assumption. Best to check online before you buy if you're using iOS. And Mac OS. So yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Like I said, Pix40 Capture, the flight planning app, that's definitely available for iOS and Android. Okay, um, I'll go on to Pix4D React. So that came out last year in um, November. Really excited about this. This is fast mapping. So whereas with Pix4D Mapper, you're focusing on accurate, really, uh, really good detailed models in 2D and 3D, uh, the, the drawback of having high quality models is that they take longer to process. So if you had several hundred photographs, it would be taking you several hours to process that. With React, the idea is you're in an emergency situation. It was designed for public safety, um, an emergency response. So if you're standing in a field and you need to know exactly what's just happened because there was a hurricane or a car crash or a fire, you don't have several hours to go back to your office on your high spec computer and process those images. Instead, you can stand with your laptop out of your truck or in your arms in the field while you're looking at the scene and process the images that you just gathered with your drone. And that will take a matter of minutes as opposed to hours. So it gets you a 2D model only. It's just as the, as the crow flies or as a drone flies in this case. And you'll see the model afterwards in literally a few minutes. You can still do some basic measurements and I'll do a demo of that later on. That one is definitely desktop processing only, though. The idea being you, you are in the field, you might not have a good internet connection, and you just have your basic computer um, and process right there and then in front of you. Okay, so we do have a question here. Um, and I, I don't really know the answer to it myself, but is there a version of PIX4D Capture that will work on the DJI Crystal Sky displays? Oh, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> now, while you think about that, I will answer this uh, a little different way, is you don't need to use Pix4D Capture to capture your images. So if you're using 
the Crystal Sky or you're using one of the machines with the smart controller, you can use the DJI Pilot app to plan your mission because what you're gonna upload or process with PIX4D is gonna be the images that you're gonna pull off the SD card. So even if you don't, for whatever reason, like PIX4D Capture and you like Map Pilot instead or uh, any of the other tools that are out there for planning the flight path, what you really need at the end is the images to, to put into the PIX4D Mapper software. So what, I don't recall if there's a version yet for Crystal Sky of PIX4D Capture, but there are other ways of capturing the data, such as using the mapping component of the pilot app. Back to you. Exactly, I would agree with that. Um, I can say that the, a lot of work has been done by the PIX4D Capture team on working with the Crystal Sky. It's um, there are workarounds to use it. You have to download um, different things to get it to work. So it's best to just check what's written online about that specifically because it is quite a, a tricky case. Um, but some people do use it. So yes, there are ways around it. Thanks. I'd say in general when you're going to use any app to fly your drone, do look up online uh, the best way to do it with the drone that you have and the app that you want to use because there's such a lot of different apps and there's such a lot of different drones and even drones by the same manufacturer like DJI um, have very different ways of working with the apps in a very simplistic way of putting it so it's not like a one suits all um, way of working. There's a lot of information on our website about that with Pix40 Capture. I'm sure DJI Go has uh, similar information online. Okay. Uh, yeah, so talking about Capture. This is what it looks like. You, you download it, you get it on your phone. Again, it's free. Um, and then it will ask you, so you pick the drone, there's a list of all the drone support, and then it will ask you what kind of plan um, you want for your mission. So it depends on what you're trying to map. If you were going to do a cityscape or looking at a residential area or some border area like a forest fire or something like that, then you probably do what we call a grid. And that's, as you can see, the second option along there where it flies in straight lines back and forth. If you were gonna do a something where you want a, a 3D model, and you definitely want to see the sides of the, of the houses uh, or there's a, a, an elevation change. So it goes down a hill, something like that. You might want to do a double grid or a circular mission. So circular is better for one, one thing like one house or one statue or tower. But double grid is good because it just means there's more photographs uh, looking at different angles as you fly around and you need you need photographs aimed at the sides of houses if you're going to recreate the sides of houses. When you're capturing photos for a model, it's a bit like spray painting with a can of paint. If you don't spray at the right angle, the subject isn't going to get covered. And that means it won't get recreated in the, in the, the modeling software. So the more photos, the better when it comes to covering everything you really want. Is and there then, any... Uh, advantage of doing both a double grid and a circular before uploading the images? In general, I would say no. It depends what you're trying to, to model and you should pick the one that's most suitable for the subject matter. So if it's one house, do a circular one. If it's many houses and you want a good 3D model of them, do a double grid. Okay. I think that would be my general advice. So it's, it's not just more is better, it's you want the right angles and things for what you're trying to accomplish. Exactly, yeah. If you're doing a circular model, uh, well, a circular flight, for example, and it's one house, you need to think about things like how high the house is. If it's got many stories, you might want to do several circles around it at different heights. Right. Whereas it's just a standard family two-story house, maybe one is enough. So there's quite a lot of information online about 
looking at the subject matter and figuring out a, out a good flight plan before you start. I would always read up on things like that before you go out, because it'll determine like how many batteries you need, how many images you expect to take, and how long the whole thing will take you. So that will determine what time of day you go out, uh, what weather conditions uh, are going to change throughout the day, that kind of thing. So have a good idea of what you want to capture before you go out. Okay. And then the, what the image on the right there, that's what it will look like when you're standing in the field. So you'll see a map of where you're standing. You'll be able, if you select the polygon mission, for example, you'll be able to draw around the edge of what you want, and then it will create lines of flight uh, that the drone will actually fly along. And you'll be able to see it as it flies, taking images um, as it goes. So you'll see the images as they're captured on your phone or tablet screen. It'll show you what height you're at. You can change the height. You can change how many uh, grid lines it flies along. So you can get more or fewer images, depending on what you want. OK, I'll continue. So that was capture. This is mapper. So this okay. is the main. Um, one question here. When you're yeah. defining the grid, can you specify the distance between the flight lines in feet or meters? I don't think you can define the distance between them. I think you can define the GSD. That's the ground sampling distance. And that's the general mark of accuracy most people are after. So if you change the GSD, it will change the distance between the flight lines for you. All right. As you change your altitude, it will adjust the flight lines and you can adjust the overlap. So do you want a 50% overlap or an 80% overlap? And that will uh, adjust the flight lines themselves. But it, I don't believe you can actually just say exactly. make the lines X number of feet apart, but you can no, adjust I the don't flight lines either. different ways. Yes, you can adjust them. For sure. You can say if you need more or you need fewer, but you can't say, yeah, four meters apart. And in reality, it would be hard to make that happen accurately anyway, because the drone gets blown a bit by the wind and things like that. Okay. Um, on to MAPA. So, MAPA is 2D and 3D modeling. And this is, like I said, our flagship software. So this is the one that most of our clients have around the world. Very popular, and uh, we, we get great, great results and great feedback from clients. So, if you want to try this out, you can get a trial online or from Compacting Perry. If you want to buy this, you can buy it as a perpetual license, or you can buy it as a rental by the month or by the year. So the main things that most people want when it comes to 3D mapping is a point cloud. I think this is the most discussed output that there is. So again, you put in your images, you've flown, or you've flown first, then you put the images in the software, and after processing, this is what you get. These are the main four outputs that most people are after. This is a quarry, and I'm going to show you an actual model of this in a minute in the real software. So um, the point cloud is a collection of points, each one of which has a position on the Earth and an X, Y, and Z coordinate. And that means that you can measure between any of the points. Within this software, you can measure distances, areas, and volumes. And the accuracy of those points is determined by how much information you've put in. So first of all, you put in the images. Usually, they're geotagged already. So if it's a standard camera, they'll be geotagged. But the accuracy of that geotag is only in the range of meters of accuracy. If you have an RTK or a PPK drone, or if you've used ground control points, then you can reduce that significantly. And that means that you can get way more accurate maps and the distances between those points will be more accurately measured. Um, it will depend on quite a few factors, but we do have people getting, like regularly getting less than one centimeter accuracy with these models. 
So that's survey grade accurate and that's that's highly desirable. Um, okay, then the mesh takes those points and creates 3D triangles between them which are textured. So it's it's the same thing, but it's in an aesthetically pleasing format. So you can see the difference between the point cloud and the mesh. The point cloud has holes in it and it's just made up of points. Whereas the mesh looks like one continuous surface. So that's really nice if you need to do a presentation or you want to do 3D printing or that kind of thing, because it looks a lot more like the real thing than the point cloud. Um, then you've got the auto mosaic and the DSM. So that's looking at the point cloud directly from above. The auto mosaic is the way it looks with normal colors and the DSM takes the, the Z uh, coordinate into account. So it's looking at the height difference. DSM means dig digital surface model. DTM is digital terrain model. So terrain means it's just looking at the earth. Surface means it's looking at everything on the surface of the earth as well, like trees and buildings. So you can see in that one that the red areas are higher and the, the blue or purple areas are lower. And that's gonna be really interesting for people that want to model oh, anything to do with the change in height. So things like water flow, um, definitely, if you want to calculate volumes excavated from this quarry, that's going to be very useful. People are often taking those DSMs and putting them into other software uh, to simulate things like water flow, for example. Okay, so now the main exports. A really nice feature within the software itself is the RAID cloud. This was created by Pix4D specifically in trademark. And that means that when you're in the point cloud, like you can see on the screen there, you see all of the original images above you, which you took with your drone, and you can click on any point and it will link it to all of those photos which contain that point. It shows all the photos down the side of the screen, like you can see there, and it shows, it like X marks the spot on each one. And that means that you can go through all your original photographs and see what, um, what was really there because maybe there was things that it didn't get recreated perfectly and you want to check out what was really the situation. Or maybe because the model removes any moving things, maybe there was a car passing and you, you actually wanted to recreate that car, then you could go back and do that. So that's a really nice way of looking at your original images and actually being able to find the things you want or the image you want really quickly. Because again, imagine if you have 2000 photographs how are you going to find all the ones that contain that particular point? You would go through for ages looking for them all. So this is a really nice way of storing photographs in a meaningful way as well. Okay. All right, I'm going to show you these softwares, but I'll just go through the uh, overview first. So we're going to pick study React. So React, like I said, came out the end of last year, and this was primarily designed for fast situational awareness. So we're aiming it at public safety, but actually it could be for anyone that really needs to know what's happening around them right now. So that could be a disaster, it could be an accident, but it could also be a moving site, like a building site. If something's changing regularly, then you can't rely on any other data because all of that will have been out of date already. If you think about Google Earth, that's only updated maybe once a year, maybe less. <laughs> if you've ever had a house extension and looked at your own house, you'll know that it will look wrong for ages after that house is completed. So that's not useful to you if you need to know what happened after the hurricane last week or yesterday. So the idea of this is that you fly, that takes a matter of minutes, maybe half an hour tops to fly your drone. Then you put your SD card straight into your computer. It doesn't have to be a good computer. It can be a very lightweight computer for the field and process in a matter of minutes in front of you, which means that in under an hour, maybe less, you're gonna have an up-to-date 2D map of where you're standing right in front of you that you can share with your team. You don't need the internet and you can export a PDF report to give to your team or when you do have internet to email back to people in the office. So yeah, this is 
really new and we've had a lot of interest in this so far. The idea is to use it for all sorts of emergency situations, so flooding, earthquakes, fire, but also things like tactical planning. So if, for example, there's a music festival, they're usually set up in fields. So most of the time, it's just a green field. But this week, there's tents all over it. There's going to be thousands of people turning up. And if there's some kind of incident, your team needs to know where to go really quickly to solve that incident. So they need a map of a, um, a temporary site. And that's exactly how you could use this software. Same with human displacement. Refugee camps grow by the day. So if you're looking at people setting up tents or there's some kind of unexpected civil unrest, this is the kind of thing you're going to need a map of so you can plan how to get in food and water as well as protection. Okay. All right, so let's go on to the software demos. I'm going to start, well, we don't have so much time, so I'm going to do it for the React. So this is what it looks like. You can download it, get a, get a trial for free, and it costs uh, just under $1,000. So it's nine, $990 for a perpetual license or $390 for a year license. So here's how you go. You put new project. Here we go. So I'm gonna put here webinar. Okay, and then I'm going to just drag up my pictures in. So here's some I prepared earlier. <laughs> and I'm just going to use 20 photographs here. So these are all done with a DJI drone, really standard. And this was a real hurricane that happened in Dominica in 2017. So I've imported the images. I'm going to start processing and I'm timing this on my phone as we go. So click go and you'll see how long this takes. Okay. <clears throat> While we're doing that, there's a question. Is Pix4D doing any development for linear flight plans, such as uh, for electrical lines or pipeline conditions, pipeline corridors? Yes. So we're doing a lot looking at um, electricity, uh, like pylons and the communication lines at the moment. So we just released a new software yesterday called Pix4D Inspect. I'm not going to talk about that too much today. But that, the idea of that is to look at the towers themselves. And then we're going to be expanding how you can fly the corridors in between the towers to look at the lines. So yes, that's directions the company will go in, and that could be expanded to anything that's in a line. So a pipeline, a road, a rail line, all of these are possibilities. So I can't promise exactly what will come first, but that's, that's of high importance, yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks for the question, Jeremy. Yeah, it's a good question. You can see on the screen here that what it's doing is overlaying the different images on top of each other. So there's a base map already, um, it's, it's looking at that and it's looking at the geotags it has in the photos, lining them up to that base map and then lining the photos up to each other. So it starts by an obvious points that are similar to the edges of roads, the colors of roofs, the angles, the textures. At the end, it kind of calibrates and shifts everything together just as it finishes. You can see the progress along the bottom. So it's 85% already. Uh, we've had there, really uh, good results with this. Is there a minimum system spec for running this? No, that's a really good thing about this one. Compared to Pix4D Mapper, where there is, this can be run on any computer. It's designed to be run on low spec computers that are intended for the field that could you know, easily be broken in the field and are hence cheaper, more disposable. So I'm just running this on my, my own laptop from the office right now. Um, not a high spec computer at all. And 
like you'll see, it'll be done in a matter of minutes. Okay, so that's almost done. The, there is a question here on React. Uh, do you get the heights of objects, uh, things like trees from the photos? And in the case of a quickly changing environment, can you have several overlays to see the progress or changes on the map per time? Okay, first question is, oh, you can see it's finished here. Um, no, you don't get the heights. This is just a 2D map. So you can take the Z coordinate into account. Um, the second question was about overlaying, I think you meant consecutive days or consecutive flights. Yes. So no, not now. You can compare this uh, to to what was underneath already, so the base map, but you would need to run a different project for each different day or different flight that you did at the moment. You can also compare, uh, like you can add in the same pictures, um, sorry, you can add in pictures from different flights into the same project. But if you're looking at differences between days, if it's changing that rapidly, then you would need to run two different projects. Okay, and where does the base map come from? Um, this, this is part of the software already. So I didn't load this right now. This was, it looks at where you are, um, and is part of, part of the arrangement of the software as far Would as I understand. Would it need internet access to be able to pull that from wherever it does, Google Maps or Mapbox or? It would the just the first time you use a software. So you need internet access the very first time you log in, but after that, then it's, uh, then you don't need it again. Okay. okay, so let me show you what we're looking at here. So, so I'm gonna click down at the bottom here. Oh, first of all, I'm just gonna swipe in and show you how far you can go, because this was only in, 20 images, but you can see a real nice detail here. So look at the roofs that have been destroyed by the hurricane. You can see over here all the trees that have been blown down. There's a telegraph pole damage here. You can see cars with telegraph poles across roads. Yeah. You'd be able to see if there's roadways, oh, here's one. There's a car with a telegraph pole over the top. So you'd be able to say to your team, that road is blocked, or maybe someone needs help that's in that car, but otherwise that road can be considered blocked. So don't send an ambulance that way, find another way, that kind of thing. So these are decisions that can be made really quickly. Um, if you look down here, there's a, there's a view, so you can compare your map to the base map that was already there. So you can see it's completely different to what was there before, and it's actually a much better resolution as well. If you wanted to see both side by side, then you can do that too. And the other thing is there is a very rough elevation. So the previous question was, is there any height? I mean, you can't get, you can't click on a point and see what the Z coordinate is but there is a very rough elevation shown here. So you can see there's kind of a, a, a river or a creek going along here, which you might not have known if you've never been to this area before. So that's just gonna be useful if there's uh, flooding happening or you know heavy rains planned, well, expected tomorrow. Okay, let me go back. So, there aren't too many things you can do in this software, which is the beauty of it. It's very easy to figure out how to use it and you can't get too lost with options. So here are a few things you can do. You can mark on points. So here's a house that I think might be interesting. So I'm gonna say that so my team can see it. And then I can measure a line. So let's see this road might need to be an entrance road. So I want to know how long it is. So that's the length, 290 meters. Okay, save that. And then 
This area looks particularly badly affected by fallen trees. So I want to know the, the rough area of this. Okay. So, great. And then what I'm going to do is I want all of my team to see that. So I'm going to export what I've just done. Uh, so I can export quite a lot of things, either a JPEG, which is like a screenshot of the whole thing, or these various options. But I want to export PDF report, and I want it to include the elevation, because I think it is going to rain tomorrow, and I want people to see where the river is, and the markers that I just marked. So I'll press export. I will save it here. And that will process in just a few seconds. And the nice thing about that is that then you can either print it out on paper if you're working with an organization that needs things like that very quickly, standard paperwork, standard size. You can also um, email it to people. They don't need the software. They don't need to download anything new. It's just a standard PDF. So here it is. You can see the whole site. It has a compass and a scale. You can see the base map with what we just created. It gives you the GSD. So this was with 20 photographs only from um, a Phantom 4 Pro, I believe. That was six centimeters GSD, which is not, not what you would call good for survey quality, but for something that did well processed in under three minutes here, that's very fast. Um, and it's it's good enough quality to measure the basic things you need in an emergency. Okay, then there's the same one with the markers I did, the, the house, that line of the road and the area. There's the surface model showing where the river is. That's a much rougher GSD ground sampling distance there. And it does give a rough elevation of what the actual heights are there for people that are interested. So there's actually quite a, a, a drop in height, which you might not have noticed from a normal 2D map, but so minus six to almost 80 meters there, there's 86 meters difference, that's steep. Okay, and then markers. Here are the three up close with the geolocation information, uh, the length and the area printed out there. And that's it. So I think that's a really nice example of this software. And then I'm pretty much over time here, Kerry. Do we need to stop? Uh, no, I think we're, we're going to kind of wrap up here. We'll see if there's any other questions. Okay. And... So I just want to show you the same thing that I ran in Pix4D Mapper. So this is both 2D and 3D. I'll really just briefly show you it so you see the difference. So that's the same base map. I put in more photographs here, but it was done on the same flight. I just picked 20 originally for Pix4D React, but this has 200 photographs in it. So if I click on the ray cloud, this shows you those photographs. And what we're going to do is show you the point cloud I created. And voila, there we go. So you can see there, that's the 3D model of the same site. And this is the point cloud. So you see it doesn't show the edges of the houses so well, which is typical for this kind of flight path, like in lines as we see above. But what we can do, if I put on rays here, I can click on a point of interest and it will connect it to all of the images which contain that point. That's what I was talking about before. And then, you can see all of those images down the side here. So if I zoom out, you could scroll down and see all the images which contain that house. So if you thought there was somebody in danger or trapped in that particular area, you could look through all the evidence you have. Yeah. And I think I could go on, but I'll leave you to wrap this up since we're at the end of the session, Kerry. Okay. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> to do, I'll go ahead and 
Oh, why are things not being nice to me here? Um, it's just beeping at me while I'm trying to change back here. So I'll, I'll get to a question here. Uh, is there a way of doing change detection with any of the products? Um, not in the two I've just showed you. We do have another one which does have a timeline. Um, this is in um, in Pix4D Cloud, Pix4D Cloud Advanced actually, which um, has a timeline feature for looking at the same site which is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. This was originally aimed at the construction industry, but could be applicable to something like a rescue operation that's going on over several weeks as well. And that allows you to see the differences each day as things are changing. And if you wanted to export volumes, for example, like you're looking at stockpiles or quarry progress, um, and you wanted to export the volumes of a certain stockpile every day that's in the exact same area of land, then you could do that and get the, the volumes per day so you could calculate differences. Okay. And uh, the answer is yes, it does exist, but not in these two softwares that I showed you right here. Okay. <clears throat> And then the uh, question is, can you use the new pictures of the terrain taken in React to plan a new mission? Well, not the short answer is not really, because React is your desktop software versus Capture, which is your capturing software. So you'll exactly. plan it you know, in your head how you're going to do it, but those two pieces don't interact for taking stuff from React to plan the new mission. They're different pieces of software. Okay. That's right. Um, any other questions out there? Um, so far, those have been some really good ones. And if there's any questions about it, you can always reach me. You, there's my, uh, you can reach my entire sales team at enterprise at multicopterwarehouse.com or the phone number 303-956-4600. If you would like a demo trial license of the software, hit me up and we can get you a trial. What, how long is that good for? Is that a week or 30 days? Or do you remember what, how long the trial days. was? What, what was it's that? 15 days. 15 days. 15 days. So yes, if you would like to try out the PIX4D products, then let me know and I can get you a trial license so you can play with it yourself. And that will work for the desktop version of Mapper, as well as the online. So you can try both of them to see what you like. There's tons of videos on YouTube. Um, Pix4D's got some really good videos on how to get started with your projects and how to make sure everything is set up well to get good results. So um, I don't see any other questions. Caroline, thank you so much for taking the time uh to join us um, very informative uh, i i know i've got me a few some clarification on a couple of the the features there so i hope it was good for everybody else um, um what, what i'm trying to understand this question i would just add in that we have a whole uh technical support website so as well as coming to members of staff in particular uh, which is always great, start another conversation. It's it's easy for you to go and just search on our technical uh, support website if you have a, a kind of standard FAQ or you think it's standard. So does this drone work with Pix4D Capture? Or um, what's the how do I measure accuracy? How do I improve accuracy? Those kinds of questions, they're all documented really well on our technical support site, and it might be quicker for you than waiting for a response from one of our support members. We also have a lot of training online, and now with the coronavirus situation, it's all really online, online. So there's loads going on. I think the next one is in April, uh, end of April, uh, and it's a two-day workshop online. So if people wanted to learn how to use Pix4D Mapper, then they could. Kerry can sell you those tickets as well. 
And we also have a certification for MAPA. So if you want a professional qualification, uh, that's worth looking into as well. You can do the workshop and buy the certification exam to go with it. And then you get a, um, yeah, a new qualification to prove that you can do this. So I I'd highly recommend people to do that. Yeah, because one of, the, one of the things we didn't go over, I mean, it was mentioned, but we didn't really go over it, was using ground control points for greater accuracy. Yeah. And that's, that can be a biggie for some people. So uh, that's a whole different workflow for uh, your, getting your project started. So the, a little too much to go into in one uh, hour long presentation. But we may do some more advanced stuff down the road, but I would definitely check out all the videos from PIX4D because there's a ton of really good information out there. Uh, uh, okay. The question is, um, MGC says that they're affiliated with PIX4D and he's wondering in what way? What does MGC stand for? Um, Motion ground control, I, I think you said. Um, let's see if I can get back to the original question. We have Major, a list of Major all of our reseller. We have a list of all of our reseller partners online. Um, it could be that they're a sub dealer of one of our contracted partners. It would be worth just dropping me an email about that and ask who that is in more detail. Okay. So um, yeah. we can try and figure that out, JD. Sure. My email address is caroline.bailey at pix4d.com. Okay. And if any of you need that, again, you can get back to me on that. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for joining. I uh, really appreciate you taking your time. Again, as a follow-up, you will be receiving an email that has the presentation, a link to the video, and a certificate of uh, completion for joining us today because I know some of your employers are looking for that. Caroline, thank you for your time and uh, hopefully uh, we can get you guys some trial licenses, get you started and answer any other questions that might come up. So thank you very much everybody. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.